Um, first and foremost, I would like to thank everyone for, for coming. Um, we've been holding um, the Hispanic Heritage Month keynote speaker for several years now, and uh, we'll continue the tradition. I'm Roxana Lopez, and I'm the Vice President of Mayas, and um, I'm going to give you some background on our speaker tonight. And Mr. Loretto is an accomplished multicultural affairs expert trainer and educator. He's a political analyst who motivates and challenges audiences of universities, corporations, and governmental agencies in the United States and Latin America to celebrate culture by appreciating the diversity and values and customs. And he's also a native of um, Texas, San Antonio, where he served as the president of the Mexican American Student Organization of St. Mary's University. He also saw a need to organize and motivate Hispanic and African American students. So Mr. Loretto um, developed several programs that facilitated the leadership process for students while he served as the coordinator for support programs in Hispanic Student Services at the Southern Methodist University in Texas. Aside from directing multicultural and international student affairs programs at the University of Houston, Clear Lake, Mr. Loretto is considered by the Spanish-speaking media to be the foremost political analyst for the contributions to the media by presenting a new dimension to the global perspective. Mr. Loretto is a political analyst for the Spanish network Univision Cha um, Channel 23. Mr. Loretto is also a founder of um, Collective Association, a consultant firm that works with industry universities and communities to develop multicultural programs. Currently, Mr. Loretto has been working with several Mexican universities to adapt the student affairs com component to their curriculum. And without further ado, I here's Mr. Loretto. Buenas tardes. I'm really happy to be here with you today, and I want to um, express my gratitude to, to Susana and her staff and everybody for hosting me today, for picking me up yesterday real late at the airport, and also for uh, taking me tomorrow really early to the airport. I think I leave at 4.30 in the morning. So uh, if we don't make it, well, <laughs> I'll enjoy Iowa even more. Uh, but anyway, I'm really happy to be here. But before, before we start talking about uh, our topic to discussion this evening, I want to share a little story with you. Um, as you know, in the Hispanic community, family is very important. And uh, one of the, the uh, uh, relationships that I have really close in my family is with my younger brother, Alfredo, who is a principal in Waco, in Waco, Texas. Uh, he's probably known for something else, but you know, <laughs> he doesn't want it to be known for that. But, uh, Prior to, to being a principal, uh, he also went to St. Mary's in San Antonio, and one day he called me down uh, and he said that he wanted me to come see him a student, te student teach. So I said, sure, Fred, I'll come down and see what, you know, how your student teaching and, and seeing how I, that experience. So the day I came down to his class, um, he introduced me to his class and I sat in the back of the, of the classroom, and he was teaching seventh grade uh, history class. And that day, as he was teaching, he was reviewing for a test that was going to be happening the next day. And just as he started the lecture, the uh, registrar came into his class, and he brought a new student. She brought a new student to, to his class. And she goes, Mr. Loretto, I have this new student. And um, he acknowledged, and then his name is Jason Matthews, and he's from uh, the Midwest, and he's going to be here in your class. So Alfredo, my brother, uh, graciously you know, took the student and said, take a seat in the front, and we're going to be reviewing for a test tomorrow. Just see if you can answer any of these questions. So what my brother started to do, he said to the class, I have three questions I want you to answer. And if you answer any of these three questions, you get five points on your test the next day. So everybody was, you know, seventh graders, they get real happy really quick. They were very eager, and Alfredo asked the first question. And he said, who said the British are coming? And quickly the class started, you know, acting a little jittery. And um, some students raised up their hands. Some other students uh, did the same. And Alfredo looked around. And he goes, okay, Juanita, tell me, who said the British are coming? And so little Juanita gets up and she said, oh, that's easy, Mr. Loretto. That's Paul Revere. I said, yes, great. So he wrote five points for, for Juanita. And then he goes, the next question is, who said, give me liberty or give me death? Everybody had their hands up. Everybody knew this question. And Alfredo looked around, and little Jason Matthews was also looking around. And Alfredo goes, okay, great. Uh, Manuelito, tell me, who said, give me liberty or give me death? 
And then Minor League Ticket Tab, oh, that's easy too. That's Patrick Henry. He goes, yes, you're right. You get five points. So he went on to the last question. And then Alfredo said, this question is worth about 10 points because we don't know if it's true or not, but I'm going to give it to you. And so Alfredo said, who said, I cannot tell a lie? And the whole class raised their hands up. And little Jason Matthew had his hand uh, up also. And Alfredo was looking around and goes, OK, Jose, tell me, who said, I cannot tell a lie? And Jose gets up and says, oh, that's easy. It's George Washington. And Alfredo says, yes, great. You get 10 points. And then Alfredo wrote it down, and he started to write on the chalkboard. And just then, little Jason Matthews gets up, and he looks around. And he looks to the one side of the classroom. He looks in the middle of the classroom. And he looks to the left. And then he says, golly, there's a bunch of Mexicans in this room. And quickly, my brother turned around and said, who said that? And little Jason Matthews said, David Crockett at the Alamo. <laughs> That's a true story. So today, as we're going to be talking about who are we as Chicanos, Latinos, Hispanics, a huge topic. I think a topic that for a lot of us has a lot of passion and a lot of uh, significance because it talks about who we are as an individual. And at the same time, it talks about where we come from. But before we start differentiating between a Chicano or a Cubano or Puerto Rican or just talking about where these names came from, I want to pose to you a more deeper question, a more important question, I think, that, that that's more relevant than just looking at it, at, at what we call ourselves. And that is, where do we come from? Where is our origins? Where is the place that we all evolved from? And I guess if we ask that question to ourselves, and if we ask that to myself, and then maybe ask my parents, where do we come from? You know, I could be comfortable in saying, oh, you come from San Luis Potosí in a small town called Cerritos. That's where our family came from, um, which immigrated uh, from the southern part of Mexico. And now we're in, in Texas. Uh, now I'm in Iowa. Maybe I can be comfortable with that. But I think it goes a little bit deeper. And I think if you think about that a little more, um, you ask yourself, where else do we come from? And for me, I find that when I pose that question, I think a lot about one of my favorite authors, and that's Dr. Leakey, who's the archaeologist who discovered what he had thought to be one of the oldest remains of an individual. And the interesting place where he discovered this individual, the remains of this individual, uh, was in the northern part of Africa, in uh, close to the old Divine Gorge in uh, near uh, present day Lake Victoria. And he started, as he, as he found this individual, or these remains, he gave this person a name. And he called her Lucy. It was a very uh, important individual, because according to him, uh, in his book, uh, she was about 3.5 million years old. And he kind of said, this is one of the first individuals uh, uh, to be uh, human, to be able to survive and to be able to, to continue to live. And as the, the book continues further as to the position in which some of the remains were found, and they said that this individual probably uh, died while trying to um, uh, to feed an animal or to bring home uh, a, a big gain for the family or whoever she was part of. And I think it's very interesting to look at that and ask the next question is, what was she called? What did she call herself? Was she African? Was she uh, European? Was she uh, something out of Jurassic Park? Uh, what was the name that we could give to that individual? And I think before we can give any name to her, I think we need to ask what was her mission and her role at that point in history and that point in time. And I think when we look at that, we can say that part of her mission was to be a provider because she had a specific mission to do, and that was to provide for her clan or for uh, family by bringing home nourishment, by bringing home this um, animal that supposedly she was um, battling with. And it was very important because it was a very important idea as to what her origins were. And if we look at, at her world and we look at the climate in which she existed, it was very different than for us today because for the first time human beings were beginning to migrate uh, and immigrate to different places because of the 
uh, climate of the of the world was getting a little bit more. Uh, it wasn't as cold, and there was a lot of things I wonder that those people experienced. And I'm asking myself, did they experience problems with immigration? Did they have to figure out, well, maybe I can't go up this way, or maybe I cannot move this way because my visa is not in that uh, uh, process, or this nation won't accept me. And I wonder if they dealt with family reunification or basic uh, ideas of maybe it's too many people here and we need to shorten um, the upper, their opportunities. And I think that individual probably didn't ask those questions and nobody asked those questions either. I think what, what probably happened was that she was on her specific mission and that was to provide for the family, whether it was gathering, whether it was hunting, but there was a strict mission and importance in, within her life. And at the same time, the climate of the Earth was, was very different. Um, the Earth was warming. You had humans, like I said, migrating to different places. Up north, going into Europe, individuals there needed extra uh, things to survive because it was colder. And at the same time, they needed uh, shelter, more importantly. And so you had people migrating north. You had people staying in Africa, which uh, they later develop, develop in the grand society somewhat, developing different cultures and just started to evolve. And then you had one other very important uh, idea or, or, or people who were nomadic. And these are the individuals I think we would like to talk about today, the ones that went from Africa and went through the uh, present day uh, China and Russia in that area and then went east. These are the nomadic uh, migration patterns. Now interestingly enough, what were these individuals looking for? What was the common uh, denominator for them? They were searching, basically they were hungry, and they knew they could work in groups, and they knew they had a specific mission within that group, within that clan, these individuals were able to hunt these giant mammoths, which were very important to them. So they followed this mammoth around this huge um, um, area, continent, looking for that, following that same mission, the purpose, was to feed the family, to grow, and to develop further, and to continue the culture. So, we had this migration. Have you ever seen a mammoth before? I mean, not in real life, but pictures of it. They're huge, they're huge animals. So, these individuals needed a lot of people to be able to, to bring one down. I like to go saltwater fishing, and uh, one of my favorite fishes to fish are tarpon. Those things are huge too, and it takes a couple of hours to to be able to rig one and to uh, bring one in. And by yourself, you probably couldn't do it. I usually need somebody else to help me. So imagine these individuals trying to follow this giant uh, mammoth. This great, great, great uh, uh, um, project to do, but yet they did that. And they went all the way to the, to the Asian continent, and then they went across into the, Af the uh, Alaskan, area and then North America and then into uh, South America. But one of the questions I guess we can continue to look at is that what was going on during this time? And you have a lot of opportunities uh, of culture at the same time. You have these people who are coming together under one specific mission, under one specific idea and developing these new, new, new things. So as they went across into Alaska, uh, one other thing, great thing happened too that the earth started to warm up a little bit more and this barren strait that took them across which was about a thousand uh, miles wide and at the same time um, was easy to come across the earth uh, warmed up and this mass left so the first time you have this continent now which is all of the Americas by itself so who are these individuals now? Are they Chicanos? Are they United States? Or are they pre-Mexican um, Americans, pre-Columbian, pre-historic, pre-period? I think they're just individuals. They have a specific quest, they have a specific idea, and then later they continue to migrate until 10,000 years, 10,000 BC, they came further down, and until 8,000 BC uh, when the descendants of these first individuals reached the southern part of uh, South America. So you have this whole new continent that was completely uh, um, 
filled with individuals who were now isolated from the original individuals. So when we talked about Lucy way over here in Africa, they evolved differently. You have this uh, great uh, migration pattern and then going through Alaska and then coming down and all of a sudden this individual is being uh, completely isolated from the other uh, people, from their descendants. So who were these individuals? And what could we give them a name if we could? Well, I think it's kind of hard to really give a name because they were still understanding their own ways of developing and developing their culture and continuing further until I think in 1945 uh, on the road to Pachuca in Mexico, uh, something really interesting happened. The Mexican government was digging a foundation for a hospital. In the midst of this hospital, um, they found the remains of another uh, giant woolly mammoth. And close to this giant woolly mammoth, they found a uh, remains of another individual who was supposedly uh, had a, a version of a weapon close to him that had been petrified, a piece of wood. And they thought that this individual was probably chasing after that woolly mammoth. And somehow, both of them either we came into a struggle, and they died, and they perished, and um, sand grew against them, or piled on top of them, and it stayed intact. But who is this individual now? Who is this new um, individual, and what was he called? You know, uh, Within that same time, was he the first Chicano? Was he the first Mexican? Was he just an individual out there trying to do something good for uh, the whole community? And I think he was doing that, being able to provide for a community and being able to be supportive of his community. He wasn't a Neanderthal, nor he, was a, he wasn't a Java man, but he was a homo sapien. And my question to you then is, what was he doing? And like I said earlier, he was taking, of, taking care of his family, taking care of that well-being community that he created. So, in essence, why was he doing all this? Basically to survive and to become uh, an important individual. And did he give himself a name? I don't know. We don't know. But I think he was three things. First, of all, first he was a leader. Second, he was a provider. And third, he was a human being who had the desire to develop a uh, new community and had a mission and had an opportunity to excel in those ideas, in those ways. Now, I just want to share with you a little bit of what his world looked like when we're talking about prehistoric Mexico. Um, the land was very different. You had dense jungles and lowlands. You had forests and patches of grass in the highlands. And then also in the, de in the northern part of the country, you had deserts. And in the animal kingdom, it was very different. You had long-haired mammoths still. You had flock of colorful parrots. Um, at the same time, you had herds of large bison. And one thing that's interesting for me is that there were prehistoric horses that are now extinct during this time. And even more, they had camels in the deserts. It's a different, very beautiful country now that had been completely isolated from where these individuals started from, um, which was very different. And as they became to evolve, known as the Paleo people, they became agriculturally based. They developed a village society, the commerce, the science. These individuals developed their own idea based upon what the um, environment had for them. And so they're very interesting people. And as they became to evolve, we've given them names. In North America, we have the Plains Indians, Pueblo Indians. And in South America, in Mexico, Zapotecas, the Aztecs, um, you have the Incas and the Mayas in South America. These are individuals who flourished. Now, we give them their names because that's what they were uh, identified to, to be. So these were the first uh, people to arrive, but at the same time to develop and to continue, which is very important for, for this discussion. And as I started reading when I was doing this research a couple of years ago, um, I read the autobiography and the writings of uh, Merico Vespucci, the individual whose America is named after. And he wrote in one of his journals that as he was talking about what he thought about the new world, he said that it is lawful to call it the new world 
because none of these countries were known to our ancestors. And my question to him is that if he were here, I would say, yes, they were known to your ancestors because they were your ancestors. The same migration pattern, the same individuals that developed and were those same individuals. So when you have um, the first Europeans coming to uh, uh, the Americas, was that the first time they had ever met? Well, physically, yes. But in reality, in the spiritual sense, in the uh, uh, philosophical sense, no. These were just descendants of the same uh, people that had come around and now they had been there. So when, in that, when Hernán Cortés writes in his journal, he says that the reason he came was for three things. First, for gold. That's the search for wealth. Second was glory, the search for fame. The third was for God because he wanted to convert all of these Indians that he had seen, that had existed, to Catholic Christians because that's what the purpose of the time was. And to have uh, the opportunity for Spain to have uh, ownership to these people and to this land and also for the Spanish language to be the number one uh, mode of communication in this area. So he had this, all of this going on. And so in 1519 when he sailed into Mexico, he, take, he took over the Aztec Empire. Uh, he imprisoned many people. He changed a lot of things. And this is some of the norms that, that he took. And we all know this story. And uh, for me, sometimes when I read about it, oh, you know, it, 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 uh, it is painful at the same time, but I think something more important happened. When he came, he saw these individuals, they were Indians to him, and then he further said that they were so docile that with 50 men, he would be able to subject all of them. And that with 100 of his men, he would be able to convert them to love his God. Very strong individual, very powerful. What was he trying to do? Of course, he was trying to take over uh, the country, trying to take over this new, new civilization and bring that back to, to his king. But he was changing that course of history, the evolution process of these individuals. Because before he came, um, the empires that were here were very different. First of all, they had a very different god, Quetzalcoatl, who is, if you read about him a little more, makes a lot of sense to their way of life. Quetzalcoatl was the plume serpent, the creator of all humanity, the individual who brought to these people the agrarian society, and he's also the one who developed the village uh, society. And he was our god, and he gave them the most precious gift of all to the Aztec people. You know what that was? Maiz, corn and the main staple for these individuals. So when their nun came, Quetzalcoatl died, and at the same time he had major cities that were flourishing, Tenochtitlan, Texcoco, huge cities. And Bernard Diaz de Castillo writes that when Cortes and his followers saw these monumental uh, cities, especially Tenochtitlan, it was five times greater than Madrid, and in Seville, this population was, uh, would, would double the population of Seville. They had never been seen before. A beautiful city. And at the same time, Hernan brought with him something very interesting, the friction of the two. Uh, one of his translators was Malentzin, or La Malinche, uh, which in a sense, La Malentzin was a slave of the Aztecs who fled and she learned Spanish, and she was able to translate for Hernán Cortés. And, when you, and, and then in the Nahuatl language, when you use uh, Lencín at the end, that means of royalty. So she gave herself a title to, uh, uh, that was of royalty and told Hernán Cortés that she was of noble blood. But, you know, he probably knew that he was, she wasn't, but she was there as an interpreter. But within the two, Hernán Cortés and Malencín, they created, or they uh, brought to this continent the first Mexican, not Mexican, but the first Aztec and Spanish child, which was Don Martin. And this is the first son of an Aztec woman and a Spanish uh, individual. Now, what was that child called? What could we call him? He's a mestizo, you're gonna bring a uh, Spanish slash New World citizen, 
Uh, what was it? We don't know. But yet, he was our ancestor. He was our relative. It's a blend of these two cultures. And at the same time, Malensin is not of this nobility anymore, but she's just Doña Maria, eh, Doña Marina, a very powerful woman. And Quesequal somehow flies away and becomes Christ. And you have this new civilization that emerges. One of the most significant um, uh, illustrations, I think, of this is when you go to Puebla in Cholula and you see the pyramids in Cholula. Uh, one of the pyramids there, um, you have a pyramid and on top of the pyramid there's a church. And the reason being they put the church there was to get the individuals to go worship uh, the Catholic faith. But yet they would go worship, but at the same time they knew they were worshiping uh, their own uh, God. But it's a way of evolving. So these individuals began to develop two very important ideas that we were talking about earlier. One was a mission, and second was our purpose for existence. And these new individuals that were a combination of Spanish, a combination of Aztec, a combination of the other indigenous populations, uh, wanted something a little bit more. Their identity had been lost, and now they were faced with this new identity of Spain. Is that kind of new? Uh, if we were to compare with some of the existence, some of the situations that we have here today? Probably not, because I think a lot of individuals experience this newness and this change, but yet they wanted that identity. And so for all this time, you had individuals who had a purpose and had an idea, but the identity was yet a little bit lost. In a sense, I think they had their own identity, but I guess we didn't really see that much. And I don't think that we can see true identity until the independence with uh, Father Miguel Hidalgo. And the independence was more important because for the first time, the concept of being Mexicano or being part of this country becomes the nationalistic idea. The reason that they wanted to leave the Spanish was specifically because you had this new country that was so much uh, intact, that had a lot of things to offer, and now we want something just for these individuals, identity, which is most important. So when Father Miguel Hidalgo rang the, the, uh, the bells at uh, Dolores, it also rang for independence for the rest of the Latin American countries, because Spain lost their importance in this continent and other countries had their nationality, and you regain identity, and you regain your purpose, and you regain that mission as to what you want to do as a group. So you were known as Mexicanos. You were known as um, Brazilians and other civilizations that existed during that time. It was a very important idea. And as that continued to evolve, you had this new essence of who we are as an individual. And kind of going a little quick, during the Mexican-American uh, problem or conflict of 1848 with the American War, you had Mexicans who were all of a sudden living in the state of Texas, living in uh, the states that, that border uh, Mexico, that the border had gone behind, that had uh, moved, and they had moved. You had people in Texas who uh, became part of the United States and that were not, not Mexicans uh, anymore. And at the same time, these individuals had land grants who were given to them basically by the Spanish first and then later honored by the Mexican government. And then now with the American government, these were uh, taken away, dissolved. Culture was dissolved. And at the same time, there was a new flow of uh, becoming more identified with the American culture. And in the state of Texas, one of the first things I think that became law, which you know we might laugh, but I think it was very interesting, they outlawed in the state of Texas, and even still today, molinos. Do you know what a molino is? A molino is where you make uh, masa, or where you make a tortilla dough from. You make a nistamal, and nistamal is made with boiling uh, corn and lime, and it, you know, it, 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 uh, it uh, boils and the corn gets a little thick and you take it to a molino and the molino uh, grinds it with a stone and then you get the, the masa. Or actually it's not masa but it's kind of like a little flour 
you had hot water, you worked with it for a while, and you make great tortillas. If you're at my house, I could make some. But I don't have any equipment with me tonight. But as, as that, that was part of, of, uh, part of the culture. But they outlawed Molinos. What do you think that did that? Because eating tortillas was a Mexican thing. And you had individuals who that was part of their culture. They did away part of their culture, did away with the Spanish, did away with the uh, houses and the opportunities that they had. So what did they lose? Identity. They had the purpose, surviving. They had their mission. They wanted to have identity, but yet they lost it. So in the midst of this, as the example I was telling you about, we had a lot of people from up this part of the country move into Texas, called carpetbaggers, or people that wanted to move into Texas. And these individuals came down, and they had something with them that was very unique to these individuals. And for breakfast, they ate what? Pancakes made out of flour. And these individuals saw this flour, and they created uh, flour tortillas. So flour tortillas are not Mexican. They're part of American culture. They're Texan. Uh, they're um, California, though this side, have these individuals creating these tortillas. Now, the significant part of this is that you can see a culture still surviving, adapting to that uh, change. And as you look at that history, you had another uh, impact of immigration in Texas, and those were the German population. Now, the Germans brought to Texas something real excellent and gave it to Mexico as well. You know what that was? The accordion, exactly. And with the accordion, you created in Mexico, Mexicans and, and Texans had the corridos, which is songs of lament, talks about the great journey because we come from what? An oral tradition. And so we had the corridos and now we have an accordion and with a bajo sexto, which is a 12 string guitar, you have tejano, well not tejano yet, but you have conjunto music, you have rancheras, to talk about the need for identity, to talk about these ideas. So now that's another aspect of culture that, that, was, that was adopted, but yet, the quest for identity was still uh, looking for. But they referred to themselves as Mexican-Americans, combination of Mexican and also living in America, living in the States, so they were Mexican-Americans. And as I started to, to look, I asked my father for about this next word, uh, Chicanos. I asked, Dad, when did you first hear the word Chicano? And I see, he said, oh, Chicanos are, comes from a long, long, long time ago. I go, what do you mean, Dad? He goes, well, back when, when uh, before the revolution, a lot of people migrated into Texas, and they couldn't find jobs there because um, it was just kind of difficult. So they went where? To Chicago and the Midwest. Because in Chicago, you had textiles. You had a lot of opportunities for these individuals to work. And so my dad said, we call them Chicanos because they live from Chicago. So that's where they, they, they went. Now, you ask friends, my friends, uh, uh, Jose Angel Gutierrez, and I tell him the same story. He said, oh, no, 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 that's not the true story. The word Chicano comes from our culture, comes from back identifying ourselves to the, in, to the Aztecs, just that we couldn't pronounce those Anahuac words, so we came up with the word Chicano. I go, well, I don't know, I don't know. It's kind of hard. Then so I went to the Webster Dictionary, and it has the word Chicano coined for 1954. And according to Webster, it says, a Chicano is an American of Mexican descent who uses military force to get his way or her way. So now we have a Chicano who is a militant, but yet lives in Chicago. It's interesting. <laughs> Anybody here from Chicago? <laughs> so I went back to my source of dad. And I said, what do you think? What do you think of this? He goes, oh, no, that's wrong. Mm -hmm. Chicanos live in Chicago, and there aren't any in Texas. Uh, OK, Dad. And so I talked to another friend of mine uh, at, at uh, uh, Tacho Mendiola, who's at the University of, of Houston, a colleague of mine. And I basically asked him, you know, the concept of Chicano, where do you come from? What is, what is this whole idea? He goes, well, to think about ast uh, Chicanos, you have to look at the origins of the Aztecs. Where did the Aztecs come from? Big town. Aslan. And Aslan is located where? In the mythical idea. Aslan is supposed to be between uh, New Mexico and El Paso and going a little bit to, to, to Arizona, an area there. 
that's where the origins of the Aztecs were, that's where the mythological idea that the, that the uh, Aztecs came from. So that was the place that they studied. And, and in the 60s, in the late 50s, Aslan became what? It became identity. Because you had movements, you have individuals who were Mexican-Americans, who had a purpose, who had a mission, who had a strong desire to be successful and to be able to be organized, but yet they were missing that sense of identity, who they were. And Aslan became part of that, that identity, that origins of where we come from and what is it that we want to do. So it was a source of power and spiritual. And yes, it was kind of militant because during the 60s it was kind of a hard and political uh, movement to bring forth these new ideas. And at the same time it served a sense to create unity. So depending on who you ask, are you a Chicano or not a Chicano? Are you Chicana? Depending on what era, they'll respond as to, yes, it's a very unified area. Or are you asking my students today, are you a Chicano? Oh, no, 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 I'm okay. What's wrong with that? <laughs> so what is that? So that's what, in the 60s, it was that quest to search. And the Chicano movement was very important. And you had people like Jose Angel Gutierrez in Crystal City, you had people like Corky Gonzalez, you had the Denver uh, movement, all these individuals looking for that identity and trying to find that little place in history, that little place in time to be able to practice and to be able to, do for, to, to move on. So and then, as I started to, to, to look at this further, I thought, where do we get the word Hispanic from? And in San Antonio, one of my good friends, Henry B. Gonzalez, who's the, the senator, in San Antonio, I asked him, you know, what, what, you know, when did you start thinking about the word Hispanic? And he said, oh, well, that's a Henry Cisneros thing. Go, what do you mean? And I go, well, in 19, uh, and in the early 80s, Henry Cisneros uh, stole the commercial of Coors, uh, 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 Coors commercial. I don't know if you remember, during the 80s, the 80s were the decade of who? The Hispanics, who was created by Coors Marketing to have Hispanics drink more Coors. And then he further said that um, Henry Cisneros was the first Hispanic mayor to be elected of a major city in the United States. You had Benya, who was a mayor of uh, Denver, but yet he was the first Mexican-American mayor uh, to be elected. That was before the Coors commercials. And now you have Henry Cisneros, the first Hispanic mayor. And then you have Archbishop Flores in San Antonio, the first Archbishop uh, uh, to be Hispanic. And then you have more movement and more things develop. But if you look at that, the word Hispanic, and you look it up in the dictionary or speak to people, the definition is of or relating to people, speech, or of culture of Spain and Portugal or Latin America people coming from Spain. So now with the word Hispanic, we zapped our Aztec uh, culture, we zapped uh, Azteco culture, all these other indigenous people, and we also did away with our friend who was unearthed in 1945, who was killing those giant mammoths, and then we also lost the connection with Lucy because that whole idea is gone. We're of this new breed who is of Spanish descent, who came, um, uh, with Christopher Columbus, who were in Cortes, and that's when the culture started. Is that what Hispanic means? And speaking to other colleagues, basically yes. And it was a word of the 80s that would be able to bring together all people that had Martinez, Gonzalez, Hernandez, that spoke Spanish, that was Cuban, that was Puerto Rican, that was Salvadorian, that was Mexican American, together. So, in a sense, that's Hispanic. So who are we then, if we were to look at it that way? Well, the average age of a Hispanic or Latino today is 26 years old, and that individual has three children, and those children are either in the fourth or fifth grade, and that individual is making between 23 to $27,000 a year, average income. At the same time, he's about a little over 10% of the population, and out of the 10% of the population, 15% of those individuals are immigrants. That's individuals who immigrated into the country um, that weren't U.S. born. And then now, 
we see ourselves more as a Latino movement. We are Latinos because that's a word that I think um, a lot of people like. Uh, and I asked my wife once, you know, do you like the word Latino or Hispanic? She goes, oh, no, I'm neither. Goes, what are you? I'm Mexicana. I'm Regio Montana. I'm Rocola from Monterrey. You know, we don't like to spend money, uh, which is good with my uh, splurging. But yet the word Latino, I think, is more important because I think that is a word that the group, as, as an individual, try, we try to identify ourselves with because it's something that really connotates this whole diversity within our own culture. So what is in a name? And what do you think it means? ¿Qué es lo que dice? ¿Qué es lo que quiere ser este, este nombre? And I ask you, before we answer that, is ¿Quiénes somos y por qué? Who are we and why? So who are we as Latinos? Well, I think we're very passionate individuals. Que nos da mucha pasión, nos da mucha alegría, nos gusta llorar, nos gusta gritar, and have a great time and from, uh, fall in love and listen to accordion music very passionately. But we have a strong desire to show culture and expression, to listen to music, to literature, to dance. We like authors like Sandra Cisneros, Victor Villaseñor, uh, Jose Angel Gutierrez. I like to listen to excellent music, like we were talking about earlier, Selena. I like to listen to Mana. We like to listen to all these individuals. One of our uh, colleagues at, 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 at work, she's from the Dominican Republic. And one time we had a party, and she, she was dancing. She was showing us some merengue steps. And I go, wow, you dance really great. And she goes, well, yes, I have to, because my parents said, if I don't dance in this family, I can't be part of my family. But it's just part of her culture, part of that dancing, part of that uh, makes us important. But yet we have something very important that we need to do. We have retos. You know what the word reto means? Reto means challenge. But it means a little bit more than challenge. And one thing that, that we did inherit, I think is very important from our Hispanic ideas, is that we also inherit the level of being a conquistador, being able to conquer, being able to be forceful. And we have to be that way to answer the retos that we have today, these challenges. The first challenge, I think, is a challenge the quality of any state's public education system to produce excellent students like you who are here, professors who are here also, to be able to be that in the forefront of any election uh, campaign. Second, if we look in Texas, we have to reduce the dropout rate for in Texas, the Texas Education Agency states that one half of all Hispanics, one third of all African Americans, one fourth of all Anglos will not receive a diploma, a high school diploma in May. And for our economy in Texas, the $17 billion lost in revenues, I think that's a huge challenge that we have to look at. And secondly, um, you look at the higher education Within higher education state of Texas, we have a little over 15% of the population that's enrolled. Enrolled. Retention rate is less. And in our campus, we have a little bit over 6% Hispanic uh, on our campus. But it's something that's very important. So I ask you, how are we able to continue the mission that our ancestors left behind us? How can we express ourselves and continue our culture and to live in this multicultural world and be able to contain our identity, our mission, and purpose? Well, the answer, I think, is very simple. And I think maybe that's why we're here today. And that's education. And I think to do that, our steps should be able to change the educational institution's agenda to develop a new paradigm. And this new paradigm has two points to it. The first is values. You have changing demographics of individuals, and you have a world that's becoming smaller, and you have technology as the catalyst that's bringing this world together. That has to be very important as far as values. And secondly, as far as needs, this new paradigm must be able to successfully um, help these fast-growing young entrepreneurs who are developing, regardless if they're Hispanic, African-American, Asians, which have a large uh, population of individuals who want to be entrepreneurs, who have this entrepreneur spirit, and they're developing. And we have to be able to, to assist them. 
And at the same time, we need to have more uh, voices being heard of change to be adapting that. And these type of programs start in a grassroots level, and they develop that. Um, because the old paradigm of education was, um, we look at the white male European perspective was set by different standards for a different time. And the needs covered a large number of people who were only accepted, who, were, who had to go into this main uh, structure was difficult for us. We have to look at this new paradigm. And this new paradigm has to reflect the growing diversity of our country. And I think, yes, we have to continue to having ethnic studies, and we need to be able to um, develop identity for students to be able to express themselves, whether Hispanic, African American, or Asian, or Latinos, or whatever we want to look at that. And we want to look at the uh, core curriculums of higher education to be able to adapt to these cultures. Um, one example is kind of interesting. I was talking about this to the students earlier this morning. While I was at SMU, one of my positions was to uh, work with Hispanic population. And um, we had an excellent Mexican-American, actually we called it the Latino Studies Program. And our chair got this great job at Berkeley and he took off. And he was a great, great person, but, but he left. So we had a vacancy, uh, the chair of our, our Latin American Studies Program. It wasn't a program, it was a major. He could major in Latin American Studies on our campus. And so I thought, well, you know, a month went by, another month went by. And the dean really didn't create a uh, program yet. He didn't create a, uh, a search committee or appoint somebody to the committee. And um, I, I called him up and I said, sir, what, what's up with our uh, 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 committee? When are we going to appoint a new uh, uh, committee to bring in the new chair to fill in this position? He says, oh, well, you know, Mr. Laredo, it, it, the, the economy is bad. We're low on enrollment. And just the, I don't have the budget money to do a national search at this point. But as soon as I get the funds, as soon as I have all this ready to go, you'll be the first one to know. I said, okay, no problem. You know, one month passed, and another month passed. And then all of a sudden in the paper I see that the dean is uh, having this international search for the medieval studies program chair. I said, wait a minute, that's kind of interesting. You know, we need to get this, search, this new initiative that you're doing for uh, the medieval studies program. Nothing bad about medieval studies, everybody's here. But, uh, <laughs> but I, you know, I think it's great. How many people are, are, are majoring in, in that? He says, oh, it's not a major, it's just a program. Well, how many people you have in that program, sir? He says, oh, we have about six. Oh, I said, interesting. But do you know how many people are in the uh, uh, Latin American studies major that's, that's been working with, with, with other committees? He says, mm, I don't know, maybe about, I always think about 20. So you know we have 125 students who are majoring in this, in this program. He says, oh, well, I didn't know that. Well, you know, I think it's very important. I think, I went on to say, I think that maybe um, this, these individuals might get upset if they hear that you're doing this, this, this national, national search for a program that has six students and that will accommodate medieval studies. Um, what do you think about that? He said, oh, well, you're right, you're right. We need to look at that. So we went back home, I gave him a ride. Uh, two days later, he calls me up and says, Mr. Valera, I want you to be in charge of the committee to bring to campus uh, the new director for Latin American uh, Studies. And I said, well, I would do that, but you know, we also need one for African American Studies. As a matter of fact, I think we need an ethnic studies program on our campus because we have all these other little programs. Why don't we consolidate? We'll be able to, to work this out. And we agreed, and we got uh, a search committee. Uh, we got the position, we got a really great program. And at the same time, he got his chair for his medieval studies. But the reason there is to look at how you can change core curriculum to reflect these new initiatives. And it's very important, because these demographics that are changing are very important. And one of the things that I, I chuckle a lot is even with our own president on our campus and other colleagues, is when administrators say, oh, I embrace diversity. I think diversity is great. I said, well, I'm glad you do that because regardless if you like it or you don't like it, diversity is going to hit on your door and you need to uh, react to it in a very productive manner we want to survive. So I think that's very important. Um, at the same time, looking at language. Language is very important. One of the things that we do 
I do consulting work with uh, Mexican universities, and one of our clients that we've been working with is the uh, Tecnológico de Monterrey, which is uh, the flagship um, enterprise of Mexican private institutions uh, in Monterrey. They have 26 campuses. They have their own satellite hookup, a uh, very uh, uh, fast university who specializes in economics, uh, business, and engineering. And when I visited that campus, I was looking through their catalog, and I said, wow, it's kind of interesting that your upper division classes are taught in English. And then they're, um, they had take a class that's called American, American Culture Class. And in this class, they learn about American life, pop culture. Like, they learn about cult jam, they learn about politics, they learn about Madonna, and she's pregnant or not pregnant. They learn all these really different, different ideas. And I said, why are you doing that? And I asked the rector. He goes, well, you know, Mr. Loredo, because of NAFTA, these individuals will be able to go to the United States and compete for jobs. And we want our students to be able to speak another language and to know the culture in which they might be able to work. I said, wow, that's excellent. So I came back home and I called my dean up again. I said, you know what? What are we doing to prepare our students to be able to have a discussion with these individuals that are, might be coming over for jobs? here, and which is completely, completely uh, uh, fine, I think. And even uh, they took me to one of their computer centers, which was donated by IBM. And he said that IBM goes down and recruits their students to come work here in the States or in other areas. I said, wow, that's excellent. But at the same time, I think for us, we have to be able to develop and be on top of these new changes in demographics and ideas. So it's important to know the history, know the culture, to be able to be passionate about it. And I think that the challenge, the reto, here is not just for Hispanics, for African Americans, for minority population, but I think it's for all of us. Because if we want to survive, we want to continue, it has to be very important for us to do that. So, who are we? Are we Chicanos? Are we Latinos? Are we from Chicago? I'm a Tejano, actually, because I'm from Texas. And, and, and I think that's very important. Well, one of my favorite Mexican authors, Antonio Velasco Piña, wrote a book a couple of years ago entitled La Mujer Dormida Debe Dar Luz. I don't know if anybody's read that book. It's a really interesting book. And in this book, he utilizes um, the Aztec myth story of El Popocatépetl and the Isasiwak. I don't know if you've ever been to Mexico City and seen the two volcanoes. One is called El Popo, and the other is called It's a Siwa. In the It's a Siwa, when you look at her, um, she looks like she's sleeping. Looks like a lady that's sleeping, and you can see her lips, her eyes, and then you can see her stomach. And she kind of looks like she's, she's sleeping. And El Popo, the other mountain, looks like a man that's kneeling over her. And the story goes that El Popo was very much in love with this aspect princess or this, this woman of nobility, but he had to go out and prove himself. So he did. He went out to battle and he uh, uh, went out to battle to prove himself. But at the same time, his best friend came up and told Lisa Siwa, hey, I think that Popo died uh, in battle. And I think, uh, you know, I think you and I ought to get together. And Lisa Siwa, she got very upset, took some uh, sleeping potion and she fell asleep. And then when her Popo came back, and he saw her there sleeping, he was very tormented and he uh, knelt next to her. And thus you have El Popo, which is one of the volcanoes, and you have Lisa Siwa next to him. And when you go to Mexico City, you can see this. And Antonio Velasco Piña writes that this mujer, or this woman who's asleep, is going to give birth to this new consciousness, to this new level of awakeness that accepts two very important principles. And what are those? identity and purpose and at the same time mission of who you are. And several years ago I took 25 students to, 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 uh, to Puebla and we stayed at the University of the Americas there in Cholula uh, and at 5 o'clock in the morning I woke them all up and I got them out to the tennis courts because I wanted them to see the sunrise and to see El Popo and to see uh, these, to see these two beautiful volcanoes and they're snow capped. Uh, throughout the whole year. And I was there with them, I told them, you know, as you see this woman that's there in this volcano, this is that new level of consciousness. This new level of consciousness that's really empowering 
that will be able to move and to shatter and to bring about a new idea of who we are as identity. Because first and foremost, everybody, all of us, we share the same ancestry, all the way back from Africa, all the way back to the individual we saw in Mexico, and to all these heroes, and also these changings, these ideas, that's who we are, because we're very apasionados. We like to speak and we like to have Spanish. Nos gusta hablar y sentir orgullosos de que somos personas inteligentes. Y eso es lo que nos motiva. Y si hay algo más importante, I think that's that new level of consciousness. So for you, I think that you here are this new awakening that she has raised, that she has given this new light to be able to say, yo soy orgulloso de ser quien soy primeramente, entonces después ser mexicano, latino, hispano, whoever we want to call ourselves because that's important. So embrace the culture, embrace the need to be diverse and embrace the need to work together. And I think that is where you'll understand who you are, understand your purpose, and understand what your mission is in this world. Thank you.